Brown eyes versus blue eyes. The third graders fidgeted in their seats and rested their chins on their folded forearms as their teacher, Mrs. Elliot, told them the rules of a class experiment she wanted to try with them. This was in the farm town of Riceville, Iowa, in the late 1960s, and all of the children, the descendants of immigrants from Germany and Scotland and Ireland and Scandinavia, had roughly the same skin color as their teacher, and from afar, little by which to distinguish one from another. But after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and the turmoil that followed beyond the cornfields that surrounded them, Jane Elliott decided she needed to do something out of the ordinary to teach her dominant caste students how it felt to be judged on the basis of an arbitrary physical trait, the color of their eyes. She announced to the children that they would do things differently that day. She laid out arbitrary stereotypes for a neutral trait that, for now, in her classroom, would put a student with that trait in essentially the lowest caste. She told the children that brown-eyed people are not as good as blue-eyed people, that they are slower than blue-eyed people, not as smart as blue-eyed people, that until she said otherwise, the brown-eyed students would not be allowed to drink from the water fountain, that they had to use paper cups instead. She told the children that the brown-eyed people could not play with the blue-eyed people on the playground and would have to come in early, but that the blue-eyed students would get to stay out longer for recess. The students looked confused at first. Then, in a matter of minutes, a caste hierarchy formed. It started as soon as the teacher told the children to open their books to a certain page to begin their lesson. Everyone ready? Mrs. Elliot asked the class. One little girl was still turning the pages in her book to get to the right one. The teacher looked at the girl, her eyes judging and impatient. Everyone but Laurie, Mrs. Elliot said with exasperation. Ready, Laurie? A blue-eyed boy interjected. She's a brown-eyed, he said, having caught on instantly to the significance of what had never mattered for as long as he had known the girl. When lunchtime approached, the teacher told the blue-eyed children they would get to eat first and would be permitted a second helping, but the brown-eyed children weren't allowed to. They might take too much, the teacher told them. The brown-eyed children looked downcast and defeated. One boy got into a fight at recess because one of the blue-eyed boys had called him a name. What did he call you? the teacher asked him. Brown eyes, the boy said, tears at the surface of those eyes. An otherwise neutral trait had been converted into a disability. The teacher later switched roles, and the blue-eyed children became the scapegoat cast, with the same cast behavior that had arisen the day before between these artificially constructed upper and lower casts. Seems when we were down on the bottom, everything bad was happening to us, one girl said. The way you're treated, you felt like you didn't want to try to do anything, said another. Classroom performance fell for both groups of students during the few hours that they were relegated to the subordinate caste. The brown-eyed students took twice as long to finish a phonics exercise the day that they were made to feel inferior. I watched my students become what I told them they were, she told NBC News decades later. When the brown-eyed children were put on a pedestal and made dominant, Elliot told the network she saw little wonderful brown-eyed white people become vicious, ugly, nasty, discriminating, domineering people in the space of 15 minutes. With the blue-eyed children scapegoated and subordinated, I watched brilliant blue-eyed white Christian children become timid and frightened and angry and unable to learn in the space of 15 minutes, she said. If you do that with a whole group of people for a lifetime, she said, you change them psychologically. You convince those who are analogous to the brown-eyed people 
that they are superior, that they are perfect, that they have the right to rule. And you convince those who take the place of the blue-eyed students that they are less than. If you do that for a lifetime, what do you suppose that does to them?